Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Talbot Brooks, and I'm the president of GITA. Just absolutely tickled to death to bring you today's webinar. Uh, very much apologize for the last-minute cancellations on the others. Uh, our speakers seem to uh, get hit with some rather serious sudden health problems. Um, today, uh, we're asking the question, do we live in the golden age of web mapping? What makes an age golden anyway, and why do we care? Uh, these questions and more are going to be explored by uh, Javier Arias today. And along the way, we're going to see how the history of the Roman Empire can inform our modern-day geospatial aspirations. We will view life not only from the eyes of a Roman emperor or CEO, but through the eyes of the civilian regular users. Roman citizens navigated treacherous political currents, uh, seeking to thrive amidst struggles for imperial succession. As geospatial professionals, we navigate equally deep waters as we make key technology choices. Which software platforms should we invest in? Which tools should we use? Which mapping standards are the most important? ESRI, REST, WMS, or something else? Which languages, JavaScript, Flex, or Silverlight? The webinar will outline key strategies for success in this, the golden age of web mapping. And today's presenter is none other than Javier Arias, he is the Director of Engineering and Construction for the East Bay Municipal Utilities District out in Oakland, California. Dad has over 20 years of experience as a professional civil engineer in California. His emphasis is water infrastructure, including planning, design, and construction of major waterworks facilities and pipelines. In his current role, he is the Director of Engineering and Construction at East Bay MUD, uh, which is, those of you who aren't familiar, one of the largest landowners and uh, utilities in uh, California. They, in fact, have about 1.3 million customers. He has the lead responsibility within the organization to plan and execute a billion-dollar capital program. Hey, I could use the loans, Av. Um, throughout his career, uh, Mr. Arias has leveraged technology, generally with a focus on infrastructure management. To this end, he has directed and personally developed many technology initiatives, including the use of CAD, GIS, databases, web applications, and modeling applications. He's an expert in dozens of different application platforms, including various .NET and Java systems. His software experience includes several geospatial projects. So without further ado, uh, I give you uh, Xavier, Xavier Arias. I should just get right into our first slide here, and I, I hope the, the relevance of, of the first slide becomes clear as we go. If I ever get to it, here we go. I thought I'd start with Egypt. It's certainly an example of one of the, the most sustained period of, of one golden age after another, one of the oldest civilizations. And what I have on the screen there, you, you don't have to read all of the fine print if it doesn't show on your, your screen, but you see... Certainly some areas called out, there's the Old Kingdom, Middle Kingdom, New Kingdom. Those are periods of time when you look at all of Egypt's very lengthy history and many accomplishments. Generally, historians say, well, if, if we look at the, the legacy of Egypt, you know, what has, it, what has it left us? What did it accomplish as a, as a culture and as a society? Can we identify certain times where all those, those activities happened? And it, it turns out, well, the, the so-called pyramid era, it started when you, you got the first dynasties. And what that means really is when you get the first kind of continuity, where there may be a, a little bit of a power struggle as each pharaoh dies and another one takes over. And we'll see that pattern in a couple of other golden ages. But you have something that starts to look like stability. So... I did promise in the intro that, you know, we wouldn't talk only about emperors. Well, how would this affect an, an, an everyday citizen? When you have continuity, you don't necessarily care exactly who the, the boss is, but you do want to know that the rules are reasonably constant from one day to the next. And a, a big thing in Egypt is that you could own property. You could pass property on to your descendants. Um, you, could, you could will it to your wife. Your wife, in turn, could will it and so on. So property rights for men and women, a big breakthrough, a lot of science that comes with that, including the kind of the birth of modern surveying, and of course the things that the Egyptians are famous for, uh, their, their art, the pyramids. Um, one thing that's, that's good to know, I guess, the world's first architect probably was in the Old Kingdom. 
He was the chancellor to the pharaoh, and he's credited with generally the first rudimentary designs of the pyramids. So th this isn't a history lesson. I won't go into all the details, but the, the point is that it wasn't the periods of war when you might think, well, that's when they're motivated to invent, to improvise. Actually, it's the periods of relative stability is when they accomplished a lot of stuff. And that's just one example. Uh, you look at, at Greece, of course, the Greeks were always, almost always at war. Uh, but there is this thing that you've probably heard about in school, the so-called golden age of Pericles. And it really didn't last all that long. It was, depending on exactly who you talk to, call it from somewhere around the end of the Persian War in 479 or so until Pericles dies. And that's around 431 BC. So it, uh, in the big scheme of things, a short period of time. But that's when a whole bunch of stuff got done. Um, a lot of the things you'll go look at in a museum, um, it, you know, one Greek statue after another, a tremendous number of them were either actually made during this time or after this time, the, what you see is a continued art style, continued um, architecture that's very much consistent. Um, if you go to Athens, you're going to probably go visit the Acropolis. Well, the, the Acropolis was designed and built in this golden age. As to, well, why did the golden age start? Why did it stop? Well, it started because the, a peace was reached with the Persians, again, an interwar period. And it stopped for two reasons. You had the equivalent of the CEO, which is Pericles. He dies, not in war, but he dies of the plague. And he was generally influential in the conduct of the Peloponnesian War. He was saying, well, let's keep this a low intensity, mostly defensive war. And some of his critics might differ, but basically that strategy was working. Pericles dies and that strategy um, obviously isn't working as much when you have a new, new CEO and actually a little bit of chaos following Pericles' death. And that, that was characteristic of Athenian democracy. Anyway, you, what, you, what you gave up was this period of stability. And with it, a lot of the advancements that are possible. And you, and you get back to, well, why would this happen? The, the innovation is not Pericles sitting there personally carving a statue. It's everybody else saying, we have, a, we have a climate here where we actually can do this stuff. We're not busy fighting wars. If we make an investment today, there's a chance we'll actually be able to bear the fruit of that investment tomorrow. So it's, it is actually a climate that is ripe for innovation. And you see the same thing in China. Um, everyone knows the Chinese contributed gunpowder and a bunch of other things. Um, and anyway, it happened during the Tang Dynasty. One of, I would say, arguably at least a few golden ages within the, the Chinese timeline. The point is, this is a pattern we see a few times. And there's one more example I wanted to make before we actually talk about the, the corresponding golden age of web mapping. Maybe the, the most famous empire of all, the Roman Empire. And you can see there is a point where it splits. And the split has to be maybe seen as an ominous sign. So I'm going to zoom in in the pre-split period. Generally, this timeline starts where something important happens, you know, that literally the crossing of the Rubicon, where Julius Caesar says the die is cast. And he wasn't the first guy that said that he wanted to be essentially emperor. He was the most successful, though. Um, he, he defeated Pompey in that, that particular case. And then what you have is a, a period, from the point of view of the average citizen, actually a period of stability. Even though if you're an emperor, it's a very dangerous way of life. If you look at the timeline here, um, the average tenure as emperor was nowhere near kind of in accord with the average span of a human life, even back then. So being at the top is a precarious kind of perch, just as it might be today in the software world. Uh, nonetheless, if you were a citizen in in ancient Rome, you're enjoying what, what has been called by many people Pax Romana. It's this period where you have a lot of things going for you. You have stable currency, property rights. Um, overall, if you make an investment where you, you commit resources in the present, you can enjoy them in the future. And you don't necessarily care who the boss is, just as we don't really care really um, which software company may be dominant a year from now, as long as we make the right calls about which technologies are worth investing our time in. Okay, so you can see where I'm going. I would say, well, golden ages are good, and they're actually better for the average citizen than they are for the CEO slash emperor, um, because we may enjoy a period of, 
stability, even while those emperors, those CEOs, are actually sweating quite a bit about whether they're going to be around tomorrow. And what we enjoy, of course, is the stability. And it comes with either this, you know, the concept of one person at the top, some kind of hegemony, or a, a balance of power. Either way, you can achieve stability. And, and then you think about what that does for your ability to innovate. You kind of have stable rules where for some reasonable period of time, those investments that you make now will be around. There, are, there probably ought to be some kind of incentive. And things like being able to own and accumulate property historically is a big one. And, and the, I think the analog in today's world would be, what about intellectual property? I think that, that's still an ongoing challenge. And of course, you need time. You need to not be spending all your time learning new stuff. You need to actually be able to master a tool. It needs to last long enough for that to be worthwhile. So not to be outdone by the Romans, I think we actually have just, we've seen one golden age that's, I would say, maybe is coming to an end here, um, Pox Microsoft. And what this trend line represents is their absolute dominance in the browser area. You see Internet Explorer, and it's at the, the low water mark during this period of time is 70%. And even today, it's not insignificant, but it's pretty clear that, that there is a decline going on. And getting right to what are the legacies of that? We as kind of everyday citizens, we don't necessarily care unless we're a shareholder what's happening to Microsoft and their fortunes. We just care, well, how does it affect our life? Well, a big thing, I would say that a, um, JavaScript itself, even though Microsoft didn't always follow the same so-called standards as everybody else, it was really thanks to that complete dominance of their browser and browsers in general. So JavaScript has emerged really as this one language and it is maybe somewhat cynical to say to rule them all and in the darkness bind them. I'm sure everyone recognizes that quote. But certainly, if you control that language, you're controlling a big part of, of the mind share of developers. And it's not just JavaScript. You know, the, the acronym AJAX, I, I broke it out here. It's asynchronous. It's JavaScript. And it's the so-called XHR. It's an XML HTTP request. And it's those things that have really made Web 2.0 a reality. Web 2.0 being kind of the general label for stuff you can do on the web where the average user can't even really tell you it's a web app. It used to be web apps, you know, you'd ask for a page, you'd wait for a while. If you did something, you'd get a full page refresh. Well, that's all pretty much a distant memory, and it's thanks to Ajax. And it, it is this, it's, to me, it's, it's a legacy of Pox Microsoft. Okay, well, what were the losers? Well, one of Microsoft's own tools was a loser of Pox Microsoft, and that was Silverlight. It's listed on the bottom here. And another one I would say is Flash. And I, I think Flash is worth another another mention because I think Flash right now probably gets more attention than I personally would give it. By the way, I expect a certain amount of disagreement with some of these points. If, it, if that weren't possible, this would be nothing but a recitation of facts. So I am trying to kind of call out, here's what I see. Here's what I think it means. And I'm not alone in thinking that Flash perhaps has some, some real question marks over whether it is the, the trend we ought to be chasing. So that's Steve Jobs in April 2010. He had a long rant about Flash. And I think he actually nailed it. He's got some quotes there. He's got issues with reliability, security, performance. It really is non-existent for mobile. And at the time, he said it was closed. I, I, would, I think you could argue that that particular accusation has been closed because um, it's been closed out because Flash was donated. It's now open source. It's owned by Apache. But unfortunately, I think the other issues persist. So just this fall, you know, you can see the headline: Adobe issues critical security updates. So that reveals a couple of facts. One, they're actually still doing the heavy lifting on Flash. You're reliant on one company. And it's really just one problem after another. It's a, it's a huge security hole. It's worth mentioning, if you're going to be there doing your web maps, uh, what technologies should you invest in? And I would think twice about this one. I would think at least twice about Silverlight. And for a long time, Microsoft was really, really pushing Silverlight as the do-everything kind of rich internet application interface. At this point, Silverlight hasn't gone away at all by any means. It's, it's used for things like playing videos, and it's great for that. The question is, well, is it good for other stuff? 
and say not so much. So that's so much for the um, some of the general web trends. Let's see what's going on kind of initially outside the web world. I think there's a whole other timeline to think about. And in 1973, that, that timeline starts when the first GIS was created by Esri. And you can see the platform that it was running in, the, in those early years. In 1986, it's actually running, I think that's an XT that it's running on. So it even has kind of a, a command interface very rudimentary graphics. You can see as we progress from the 90s through 96, different milestones along, along Esri's trajectory. I think a, a breakthrough release was ArcGIS 9, particularly 9.3 in 2008. That's when they published what's become known as the Geoservices REST API. And it's, it's an API that even, even five or six years later, where we're getting to now, it's it's a very imposing API, and in other words, very rich. It can do a lot. I think that's that's if we're viewing Esri from some future um, historical lens, we'll, we would say that somewhere in that 2008 period was certainly within its golden age when it came up with a really significant way to harness the power of the web that it saw was there and come up with a great API. And if you look at their offerings since then, you know it's like a feature here and a feature there. But the big thing that I think that makes them powerful as a web map player is that API starting in 2008. So you might be wondering, okay, we, Pox Microsoft, we saw what clearly had happened, but it wasn't clear that it had happened until it was almost over. I mean, that's the problem with, with golden ages. They tend to be very obvious in hindsight. And what motivated me to title my talk the way I did is, Imagine if you are in a golden age, would it be helpful to, to realize it while you're in the golden age rather than being someone talking about it after it's all over? So it's reasonable to, to ask, are we in fact in some kind of golden age for Esri? Is it, is it the, the pox Esri where we can say, all right, if we do it Esri's way, we get all these benefits of a golden age. Remember, a predictable environment. You can make an investment today that will pay off tomorrow. And certainly, there's some evidence for that. Esri's market share has always been pretty good. And years ago, when we decided to make our own GIS choice as Esri, we looked at them. They were the market leader. And we said, well, that's a good sign that they will continue to be a market leader. And of course, they've only consolidated that market share since we made that decision. So they've gone from being fairly dominant to being extremely dominant. But I think there is one asterisk on this. That dominance is really professional mappers. It's 70% of GIS professionals use Esri software. Well, what about all the other people using maps? It turns out there's really a whole other parallel world going on outside of, of the professional mapping arena. Of course, we all know this because we use these tools every day. People may not appreciate that MapQuest is actually still around. They're just no longer dominant. but this all happened in a very short period of time. So in 1996, we get the first really rudimentary web maps. Google says we can do that too. And in 1997, uh, Google itself launches their web, their map product. Actually, took you know measured in web time. It took quite a while before they had a map product. I think one of the things is they waited until they had something that was really pretty impressive because they follow in short order. It's not just the the maps launch, but they add. The satellite imagery, just a few months later. The API, a month after that. So things happened very quickly once Google decided they were going to do this. And now we, we take for granted things like Street View, and you can, you can go look at a hotel before you visit it, and so on. Google is so dominant in this consumer mapping area, they, just, they can make up a standard. It doesn't even have to be that great of a standard. It can kind of have flaws. If you were there with your whiteboard designing a standard I'm not sure you'd come up with KML because it's it's almost grown organically at Google over the years. So it has some odd inconsistencies. Even just this little snippet I showed you, you see it, case sensitivity is not even consistent. It's just it's stuff like that, and it, it it's permeating the KML standard. Nonetheless, it's incredibly dominant. One of the things that's become very dominant is we dusted off an old projection. It turns out this projection, it dates all the way back to somebody um, named Mercator, as you might have guessed. And this map is from 1869. So it's not like this is, oh, it, it's a new projection and we had to make it, you know, for the age of computers. No, it's a very old projection. 
It's always had some advantages. One advantage it has, if you want to show the entire world, it's actually not such a bad choice. And then if you want to show the entire world with very simple mathematics behind it, and this is the kind of math you can see, you know, it's things you would have learned in high school is how to, you use that when you're calculating coordinates on a Mercator projection. And this might be a little daunting at first. This is how uh, your, your web maps behind the scenes are navigating as you, as you scroll the mouse wheel from actually level zero, which is not even shown. Level zero is you're looking at the whole world in one tile. That one tile is 256 pixels in each direction. So you scroll the mouse wheel once and you go to level one. You scroll it one more click and you're at level two. And you can see how every square is becoming four more squares. And you do have a little bit of math here to navigate, you know, from a tile coordinate to a lat long and, and so on and, and back. But it's actually remarkable just how short and computationally efficient these formulas really are. If you compare them with other alternatives we could have done, you know, uh, let's say you had a Lambert conformal conic projection, and you want that to work over the whole world, and you want it to tile nicely, it turns out it would be a huge mess. So this was a great choice. And it's so simple that you're able to do web maps in a variety of different contexts. You don't need a, an, an incredibly um, powerful server. In fact, all this math can happen within JavaScript. Of course, JavaScript, dominant language, this is all kind of converging here. So what are the, the dividends of all this so far? You have, you have Google deciding they're going to really push what turned out to be a great way of presenting maps on the web. It was a particular tiling scheme, very well chosen, and they were building on Pox Microsoft. So in order here, you have Pox Microsoft. It made a really stable apps platform. Also a very free one, too. If you think about old apps platforms, you're supposed to go buy some development kit or at least sign up for a bunch of stuff where you, you're clicking one non-disclosure after another and so on. Well, with the, Pox Microsoft is giving anybody Sitting in a cave, you can decide, I'm going to go write some software with free, uh, free tools, free everything. So you, got, you have that to build web maps powered by Ajax. And we already talked about what Ajax is. Web Mercator, um, reaching back all the way through the centuries, Mercator became incredibly dominant after, after a couple centuries of, oh, some people used it and some didn't. Flex and Silverlight, maybe they were already tottering a little bit. HTML5 comes along, and I think it, it pretty clearly trumps them. It, it fills in a lot of the, the gaps that had existed up until that time. You have what I'm calling Pox Esri with a couple of maybe footnotes on that. And th those footnotes are because Google, in the meantime, is entrenching, I'd say, really two really big standards. The tiling scheme itself, the Mercator Web Tiles, and KML, that flawed standard that has become ubiquitous. And as far as, well, you know, people might want to say, you know, Esri was really doing that all along. It was really part of their master plan. Well, not really. So November 20th, 2009, I think is certainly a defining date where it was pretty obvious Google's market dominance, as well as the fact that their approach just plain worked really well. Uh, Esri modified their web tiling scheme it wasn't a bad scheme, but they modified it to be a direct match of Google's. They said, okay, our tiles are going to be laid out exactly the same way. They're going to be exactly the same size. And that's clearly in recognition of the fact that, well, Google won that round. So there is something of a piece so far. If you're, an, if you're a random developer, that's good for you, actually. You can say, all right, I don't have to worry about as many different tiling schemes. There is, there is at least a balance of power, even if there's not one person calling all the shots. Remember, another ingredient for a golden age. But I would say it's not a true piece. Because there's a, still a lot of turmoil out there. And these are some of the areas that are still not settled. We, we have almost too many different web standards. I mean, there is kind of a programmer's joke. You know, we like standards. That's why we have so many of them. And that's certainly the case here. If you want to do something with a web map, you, you have so many different ways you might do it. If you're a rookie just wading into it, there's probably a lot of wrong ways or a lot of ways that will turn out in hindsight to not have been all that great. Uh, and it, it really depends a lot on what you're trying to do. But you can see you've got some dueling standards, Esri's REST Geoservices API at the top. You have some open source standards that are really good. And then you have 
what about at the, the bottom of it all, so-called slippy tiles, I already showed you that. You don't actually need a standard for that. You can just go write your own code, make it very lean. I mentioned that Google won the kind of the war of the web tiles. We're okay, we're all going to do it Google's way, but we all call it different things. Uh, there's this group called EPSG that exists really, among other things, they want to set some useful standards. This, this all, EPSG, by the way, it has to do with um, exporters of petroleum. As you might imagine, petroleum is a huge motivation for mapping the world properly. So it's actually a petroleum group that took the lead in describing standards for spatial references. So you see EPSG, that's what it's about. It's Petroleum Exporter Standards Group. And then you see this number, EPSG, 900913. Well, if you squint a little bit, that looks like the word Google. And that's, it turns out that's Google's standard for what we ought to call Web Mercator tiles. And then if you look at the third line, you got 102.113 or 102.100. Those are both ESRIs. We're not really sure why they have two. They, they, it turns out they, they mean the same thing. And then there's 3857. It's an attempt to be vendor neutral. And then what about CRS84? It, really, all those things mean the same thing. But it's a nightmare if you're there writing code that is supposed to, for example, download some, some tiles somewhere. It could be a WMS server. And it tells you, oh, I, I'm going to give you tiles, and they're, they're georeferenced to 900, 913. You may be expecting 3857. The correct thing to do is to ignore that difference, but you have to write special code to do that. It's just an ex extra complexity nobody really needed, but we're stuck with. Security is another concern. I, I think security has turned out to be a way bigger deal than people thought back in the 80s. And as a result, the, the ways that we have of dealing with security are what I would characterize as patchworks. They kind of work, but they have flaws, and you don't know you can't take it for granted that a given system will do security a certain way. Everyone decides, well, which of these things represents the best security for the least hassle? And they might choose JSONP or cores. And I'll, I'll show you a little bit about that to make this just a little more tangible. So here is an example. It, you're, you're thinking, okay, I'm, I'm really jazzed about this. We're living in the golden age of web mapping. I'm going to try out some of these golden age ideas. I would imagine in a golden age that we could get data from, say, the federal government. You know, I've heard about data.gov and all that. I just, I just want to take some of that nice federal data and go use it. And there's a couple examples that I've worked through in some detail. And just to see, well, what actual steps do you need now in this somewhat of a golden age to use this data. So the first example here is NPMS. That's the National Pipeline Management System. So that's where the, the feds will give you ESRI shape files, and they've got these high priority gas lines. So it's, it's good for a water utility. That's why we know about it. And then there's some kind of secure infrastructure stuff that's much newer. And instead of giving you shape files, it's a different part of the federal government they're saying, well, we're just going to publish it online, so they're using the ESRI REST geoservices. And this, this particular data set's hosted by Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. So looking at what you actually do, let's say you felt like using this NPMS data. Here's what you would do in our golden age. Maybe you want to set it up as a WMS, web mapping service. So you can take a free server, in this case, when I did this, I chose Glassfish. There were other choices. So put that onto your system for free. You can get GeoServer also for free, and you install that as an app on top of Glassfish. And then you do some configuration steps on this GeoServer software. And I mentioned that because of the fact that we have different names for the same thing on web tiles, uh, step 3A here, where you're adding various web mercator projections, that's an entirely manual step. You just have to know to do it and go do it right. And that would not be required if, if we lived in a kind of a utopia where everybody had the same name for the same thing. So 3A, not really a lot of value in having to do that, except it won't work if you don't. I told you security was a, a patchwork approach. Evidence of that is this thing called cores. And, and it, it turns out that's cross-origin resource sharing is what cores is about. And there's a slide that shows you what, what we're talking about with cores and why it's important if you're doing web maps. So having put in this thing called the cores filter, 
Then you have to, to edit the configuration file in GeoServer. So really, steps A, B, and C, those are all because we don't really have all of our standards nailed yet, I would say, when it comes to web mapping. So these are the little bits of, uh, of glue you need to make these systems work together. Once you've done that, then it's pretty easy. Then you get back to what you thought life should have been like, where all you do is you, you point your little GeoServer thing at the shape file and you say, publish it. If you want to label it, label it. This would be a few minutes if it weren't for steps 3, A, B, and C. So I'm going to talk about, well, why, did, why do you have to do them, since they probably take an hour by the time you're done. This is just so you understand cores. This is a mock-up, one of the very simplest HTML files you could come up with. It's in an imaginary URL. And it's, so I imagine there's a domain somewhere, and it's called foo.com. And we have a test file, and it's called test.html. So imagine you've just edited this file. You're hosting it on your, your domain, which is foo.com. Let's see what parts of the file work and which ones don't. Well, it turns out you can point to a script that's at bar.com, even if you're at foo.com. So that's OK. We can do that. You can point to images. And, and this is obviously very, very common. You see lots of pages that point to, to images from anywhere on the internet. So we kind of all knew images would work, and of course that's why images can be an attack vector. And it's much less common probably to see these um, these external JS. Not rare by any means. People use so-called CDNs, Content Delivery Networks. They put their script there. They put their images there. One of the reasons they do it is to get better speed, and it's perfectly okay because it's cross-domain. All right. If Ajax is so important, it's the legacy of Pax Romana, remember, then we would want to see a lot of lines of code that look like this, you know, where we've got some kind of XML HTTP request, and in two lines of code, we have what we want. And obviously, it's usually more than two lines. It's got asynchronous loading, so you, you talk about it, a different function that gets the results. But this is the gist of it. You should be able to point to an XML file somewhere and then that'll go asynchronously, be fetched, and you process it all in your JavaScript on the page. And this line would, would work as written. Sometimes people are a little confused when they, they try this and it doesn't work. And this is where we're trying to get the same thing from bar.com. Well, it, it doesn't work because that's considered a cross-origin resource request. And it won't work unless you do some special magic called cores. And it's, it's because the idea is um, people have thought about this security risk, and they said, we're not going to allow it anymore. And that implies, well, there, there was a day when we did allow it. That's absolutely true. The, the early versions of the, the browsers, like I think it was IE4 and 5, you had the ability to make these XML HTTP requests, and they, they would make them anywhere, literally on your C drive. So you could, this was obviously really great for someone writing a virus. They could basically rummage through somebody's C drive just by putting a, a reference on the web page. Gaping, gaping security holes. And as I mentioned, you know, security's turned out to be a far bigger deal as the course of time. So cores is kind of a, an attempt to fix that. It requires extra work. Oh, I, I shouldn't have advanced. What what cores means is you have to then put this filter on, which is basically a shim when this request goes through bar.com, you need to somehow have established a list of trust where when bar.com gets that request, it's going to be expecting to see some kind of configuration that says request from foo.com, I will honor. And your browser needs to, of course, be configured to allow this by default it is. What it means for you is extra setup. If it works, you're, what you're not having to do is say, well, the only way to get cross-domain, if I can't do cores, would be something like, let's, let's take data and shove it into a script. That's called JSONP, and that's what you see all over the place. Esri uses JSONP a lot, but it's, it's way less efficient than cores. So you have those two different ways of overcoming cross-domain issues. I didn't mention proxy serving, which would be a third way, and, and not a good way because it's, it's extra slow. It's probably doubling your time. And it doesn't always work. If you have a mix of intranet and internet content, proxy servers usually will fail. And I think in the context of our one-hour golden age uh, webinar, I'm not going to get into the details of 
why your proxy server method is prone to failure, but maybe a future seminar. So I hope that's given you a sense just with that example that even though we're in this pseudo golden age of web mapping, it's these, there are a lot of details that have to be nailed down and, and they would be way simpler if we had a, even more dominance actually, one way to approach cross-domain resource sharing instead of a couple and you're not really sure which one will work with what server. The reason everyone's probably listening is, you know, we all have to make a reasonable projection as people who use mapping software, maybe we develop mapping software. We need to make our own probably imperfect assessment. What does the future hold? And we don't have to get all the details right, but of course we're like that Egyptian citizen or a Roman citizen trying to figure out where should we invest our time? Is it even worth investing? Is it, you know, can we predict enough about the future to make investment today remotely worthwhile? So I've made my own guess at it. It will be no surprise to anyone who's listened this far that you know, what I see in the map future is continued decline of flash and flex and silverlight with regard to mapping. Um, silverlight, I think, is going to still be around on Netflix for quite a while. It works great for that. Uh, IE6, and actually all of its ilk, I think, will continue to decline. And you can see the market share upper right. It really shows that. It's not just that IE6 is just about dead, but all of the internet browsers um, made by Microsoft are in decline. You might wonder what's filling that space, and mostly it's Android, actually. Android-based browsers, it turns out, are filling most of that, not Apple, as you might have guessed. Because remember, worldwide, Android is incredibly dominant, even though certainly where I am in the Bay Area, you might imagine it's, it's all about Apple as kind of the local company and it's very trendy and all that. Worldwide, the numbers are with Android. Okay, that's number one. Number two, uh, I think the REST API by Esri, it, it will, I think, continue to become even more dominant. And part of that, the reason I believe that, I think it is that it's an excellent API. And, and it already has quite a bit of market share. If you look at the fact that the, one of those examples I gave is the federal government is using it, they use it heavily. They're not alone. Virtually every government agency, when they publish their data, they might publish it with all those other standards, but they're going to make sure they publish it with the Esri REST API. And of course, HTML5 and JavaScript, they're going to be even more important. And part of the reason for that is mobile, which I don't have a separate graphic about. Mobile itself, with even if everything else I said was wrong, the growth of mobile and the fact that mobile and Flash Flex don't really play well together, those two factors alone would make it pretty much inevitable that HTML5 is going to get bigger. And you can see that gurus opine in all different directions. There's a little headline here. You know, Zuckerberg of Facebook, he's confused about HTML5. Everyone's confused about exactly what detail will, will turn out to be most important. I think here, here he's saying, well, we shouldn't have put so much effort into HTML5. I think he's already been proven wrong. So that's a very high level overview of what the future holds. Getting into just a little more detail on stuff that's specific to maps. Let's say you, you decided, okay, this afternoon I'm going to write my first web map program. I really like this whole Ajax thing. I'm not going to do Flex. I want it to be JavaScript. What next? Well, you still are confronted with a bunch of choices. And this is by no means an exhaustive list of choices, just enough to give you a feel for it. You could say, well, I want to use Google because, you know, I hear that they're kind of dominant in the consumer web map area, or Esri because they're dominant in the professional mapping area, or maybe open layers because it's free and open. And actually, all, all those statements and maybe reasons to use them, they're all absolutely true. It depends really on what you're trying to do. If you want to get your first web map ever, you're not going to find an easier place to do it than Google Maps. It is fast, easy to use. As you get deeper into it, and especially if you start to know other APIs really, really well, you'll start to get a feel for the strengths and weaknesses of each of these APIs. I'd say the Google API, they've kind of tried to refactor and refurbish it but it still kind of shows their hacker legacy. Things are named weird things. Um, parameters and names aren't always consistent. There's no guarantee that it's free for the thing you're using it for today and certainly not tomorrow. 
so that's that's kind of my synopsis of Google. Esri uh, shows tr a tremendous amount of discipline in the development of their API. I'd say excellent. It's a standard others should be trying for in terms of documentation and testing and so on. Like Google, not necessarily free. Depends on what you're using it for. And I, I don't think they have yet rivaled Google in terms of speed or reliability. Like Google really, as far as I can tell, is about the top in terms of availability of their servers. And then to get to choice three, open layers. If you want assurance that your code will always be free, you won't have some reliance that's going to cost you money, open layers. You own, well, you pretty much might as well own. You have a free license to use this thing. Modify it any way you want. Use it commercially. Um, you can use it with or without an internet connection. So you can, you, for example, host your own tiles. Their API, I mean, if, if Google shows a hacker legacy, I think what OpenLayer shows is, well, they're not hackers, but it's a huge community, and everyone has their own take on how it ought to be packaged up. So you see definitely uh, things aren't necessarily laid out the way you might have liked. If one person had designed it all, it'd be all clean. So the API is not the easiest to use. It's the worst learning curve of all of them. Those are some, some discrete choices. I think if you step back a little bit, think about the trends in JavaScript and their implications, of course, thinking about maps. First of all, there's a trend toward everything being asynchronous. And if you're a JavaScript developer, mostly this is really good news. It does mean that your code gets more complicated. Just as if you, if you were use, using uh, multi-threaded fat client apps, let's say you're using Java or .NET and you, you decide you're going to do something with multiple threads. You know, clearly, you're doing it for a reason, I hope. If you're doing it just for fun, you're just adding complexity to your life. You get the same thing, I think, with JavaScript, where you can do a lot of things massively parallel. You can load JavaScript files, load XML files. You can do a lot of things where it, you'll get a very high performance application, very responsive. But you need to get used to the idea that when you execute a line of code, the result of that operation may not happen until later. And if you care about when, you have to worry about serializing all those operations. It's not necessarily trivial. Number two, big trend. Um, along with that, not so necessarily trivial is the JavaScript apps themselves. Instead of just putting a little bit of kind of user interface um, bells and whistles, JavaScript is now being used for, for things that actually solve pretty serious problems. So these programs, they're getting big enough. Everyone's worrying about things like namespace pollution. In other words, if you have a function name in JavaScript, and you start being worried about whether it's going to be the same as some other function name somewhere in what turns out to be a very large application. So there's this thing called namespaces. If you, if you Google this, you'll learn more if this is new to you. They were a first generation fix to this. Think of it as kind of, <coughs> Instead of having a big global place where all the names have to be unique in that global place, you get to subdivide it with these things, namespaces, or really just objects. But I'd say there is a, a wave of the future, and if you're trying to figure out, well, where should I invest my time? What, what is the kind of the newest and best way? This thing called AMD, Asynchronous Module Definition, no question, it's the wave of the future when it comes to handling this complexity problem with JavaScript. So it, it is relatively new. I'd say 90% of the code, you just kind of filch off the internet to kind of solve your problem and be on your way. It's not written with AMD in mind. But if you're writing a kind of a, from a fresh sheet of paper, you're making a new program, you would want to think about, yeah, let's take my modules as AMD. It'll be better. Lots of reasons. It'll be a more performant application. If you're using something like Dojo, you know, which is favored by Esri, they give you a choice. You can kind of take it the AMD way or the old way. Definitely do the AMD way. And then what we're seeing, another big trend here in JavaScript, all the things that used to work for fat client apps are, are now being adapted to JavaScript. Things like static analysis. In other words, these tools that they look at your code. When the code's not even running, they're analyzing it for flaws. And we took that for granted with fat client apps. You know, it, this looked like in the old Microsoft tools, it was things like setting all your warnings on on the compiler. 
And then you could buy third-party tools that called Lint, for example, that did even more. Well, you're seeing that in the JavaScript world. JS Lint is a, a free and good example of that. So that's analyzing code that's not running. Analyzing code that is running, you're seeing more of that. Firebug just gets better and better. And Microsoft, they, they certainly are behind the curve in a couple of areas. I'd say their developer workbench built into the newer versions of their browser, that's not one of the areas they're behind in. It's actually very powerful. So if you're developing as you should for dual platform, I would take the best of both of those debugging tools and be using Firebug for what it's good at and the, the developer workbench for what it does. And you're seeing JavaScript treated really as a full-blown application development system. That means you actually have modules. So you think about compiling JavaScript now instead of just flinging it into your page and it'll be interpreted later. You think of it as a compile step because they're doing this stuff called minifying. They're taking what might be 100 files, crunching them into one, renaming all your variables, stuff like that. I figure if I didn't mention it, somebody would ask, well, what about the cloud? Isn't that reshaping everything? And I don't think so. I think there's kind of a mixture of reality and hype about the cloud. Think about, first of all, who's promoting it and why. The number one reason people promote the cloud is that vendors that are they're promoting it because they can shift from a sell it once to sell it forever kind of model. It's a revenue stream. They don't just sell you a box. They, they sell you a subscription. And that doesn't mean it doesn't have value. I think it has varying degrees of customer value depending on what you're trying to do. So there's some benefits that are listed here. A big one would be less hassle. If it's saving a bunch of labor costs for you because you don't have to run your own servers, you don't have to be expert in as much stuff, that would be the number one reason to think about cloud. For some people, scalability might be important. That's the second benefit listed here. And that depends on, on whether you're, you're kind of chugging along doing more or less the same thing every day, or do you get peaks where your peak might be 100 times the number of users as your non-peak period. If that's the case, then cloud computing could be really good. Reliability, I think, remains an open question. Usually the cloud providers will be fairly reliable, but you also have additional points of failure along the way. You, it's only as reliable as your ability to reach those servers. So if you're on a, a DSL connection that's, that's down half the time, well, obviously cloud computing wouldn't be a good idea for that. So I would be thinking in terms of cost savings, you could have to pencil it out. What are those cloud fees? What will they be in the future? Weigh them against any, any labor savings. There could be a huge benefit or not. And the guy at the lower right, I think, has maybe put a spotlight on some of the security concerns. That's number one. And by the way, that's always been on our list. That's why we don't do a lot on the cloud right now as a water utility. We have information that we don't want shared with the entire world. So we haven't been one of the early adopters of let's put all our data on the cloud. No, we're still, we've been worried about security long before Snowden decided to publish all his stuff. Uh, and I think he certainly highlighted the fact that anybody's server is vulnerable to a breach. I already mentioned cloud computing is reliant on having that fast internet access. And think about the vendor lock-in. I think on the plus side, cloud computing, if you do it right, could allow you to change vendors fairly quickly, to scale up very quickly. You just want to be careful that, that you, you know enough about what's going on that, that you can treat the vendor as essentially an interchangeable part. So a, a cautionary note here is, you know, at any given time, people have, they convince themselves, as I probably have, that they, they actually understand what's going on. They think they know what the big thing is. These people clearly thought, oh, we're on to the, the big thing. We're going to wait for this product to come out. They may have forgotten that they weren't the first ones to think that. Now, here's the Windows 95 launch. And, you know, look at just the jubilation on this guy's face as he gets one of the first copies of Windows 95. And he'd almost forgotten all about that day when he came back for the Windows 98 launch, which was going to be also, you know, the solution to all of their problems. The, the overall point of this slide is, what looks like really the the final technology that's just going to take care of everything, it's, I think it's always subject to being replaced by something else. And one of our tasks here, we don't want to just be like sheep running from one product launch to the next. Think about which 
which trends are really the deep trends that will guide our, our actions today. So that, I think I'll, I'll summarize at this point. We've got lots of great choices. In a couple cases, almost too many choices, and you have to sort out which, which technologies, which standards, for example, cores or JSONP, Google versus Esri versus open layers. You've got to make those choices depending on what you're doing. Recognize number two is going to be true for a while. Individual vendors, just like individual Roman emperors, may come and go. Uh, you know, as the, as the private citizen, you need to try to insulate yourself from all that drama that may be occurring at the top. And the way you do that, think of any one vendor, any one Roman emperor, as a very transient entity. Uh, that, that emperor may be out of power tomorrow, and you really want that to be something you don't even care about. It's just a different name. You're kind of you're going to keep doing what you were doing. The investments you made yesterday, you hope, are still good tomorrow. And there's a couple things you can do. In addition to what I've already covered, I think map code is going to remain among the, the more fluid parts of a bigger application. Try to app, isolate it in one area within the app. And know about more than one thing. If you choose Google, for example, and Google eventually changes their license terms, you don't want that to be a crisis. It should just be flip a switch and I'm on to the next vendor. It should just be a, a non-event when something like that happens. And I think De Niro said it best, and that's in the box there. You know, 30 seconds, if you can't do that, at least make it one day. In one day, you can dump a vendor and move on to the next one. That would be my overall advice. And with that said, I, I do think we are indeed living, as I mentioned at the beginning, we're living in a golden age of web mapping for the most part. I think there's value in recognizing you're in a golden age while you're in one. And, and future historians, if, we're, if I called it right, will agree that this was maybe not the golden age, but a golden age of web mapping. So that's all I had to say for today. I, I don't know if there's any questions, but I'm sure Talbot will tell me. Thank you. Tab, thank you so much for an absolutely wonderful presentation. It really embodies the, the spirit of GITA, which, you know, back to our roots, started as an organization uh, through which uh, the community could explore potential solutions from a vendor neutral perspective. And uh, um, just a really great thing. Uh, with that, then we do open it up for questions. If you have a question, please type it into the uh, chat window and I'll be sure to share it with Zav here. And uh, you can listen for a response. I'd also encourage folks to please join GITA. It's through memberships, uh, both at individual and corporate level that we're able to provide content like this to all of you. Uh, if uh, you're able to volunteer, boy, we'd like to hear from you as well, and are certainly open to future suggestions for speakers uh, as the webinar series continues. Um, uh, uh, with that, in fact, we have another one uh, rolling up here um, uh, later in December. And give me just a minute and I'll get it in front of me. Um, please come back and join us for uh, uh, um, wealth status and classification uh, as it deals with the oil and pipeline industry. That will be on December 19th at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time. And again, all of these webinars are uh, recorded and posted at GITA's website, which is www.gita.org. Um, it's a, uh, a WebEx-based recording that you can play back. Um, Zav, I have a question here. Would you be willing to make this presentation available as a PDF? Sure. Okay, we can certainly uh, do that, and we'll make it available through the GITA website as well for uh, those of you who are asking. Um, any other questions? We'll give it a minute for folks to type. Uh, if not, we thank uh, you tremendously for your time and effort. Uh, a fantastic and very informative presentation. All right, barring, barring no questions, that will be uh, the end of today's webinar. And again, uh, go to the uh, GITA website and uh, uh, um, check us out. And uh, um, uh, uh, listen away. 
Thank you very much. Thank you. Manon, are you still on the line? I've unmuted your speaker. Professional Development Hour. Um, I can try to do that right now. We almost have our uh, logging system up and running, and I captured uh, the attendance here. So we should be able to, but if it's something you need sooner, I can certainly uh, send a note on behalf of GITA. Uh, uh, stating that you attended uh, this webinar. Manon, are you there? Hang on just a second, Pat. I'm trying to figure out how to stop. 